So the, the China is Chinese until you could say very recently or in 1420. So there's one time or like very recently, does, uh, do, uh, do the Chinese actually think about going beyond to fight? I was going to say, I mean, Fujian, yeah. I, if I'm not mistaken, that yeah. port yeah. was yeah. where the galleon trade, I believe they were going down to Manila to yep. uh, basically take silver, or sorry, from, from the Spanish. Yep. Um, and and as, far as, I, as far as I know, out of, outside of Jilinha or whatever in the yep. 15th century, that's like the limit of their maritime exploration, yes, basically, it's, right? It's, it's, mean, it's, it's, down to, uh, it's down to the Philippines, yeah. Yeah, it's just down to Manila and back, right? Yeah. yeah. And, so, and most of the ships are actually not Chinese as well. You're not allowed to leave. When uh, if you if you left China and you went and you go back, it's it's a capital offense. To, to yeah, and so so that's the Beiyang that's the Beiyang fleet. Uh, uh, granted, uh, de um, depending on um, you know even even with all these even all these things, at least it's it's relatively strong, and that's why I'm saying that that period in the 1890s were uh, was relatively uh, strong and a, um, a little glimmer of hope that using this Chinese. Um, uh, culture and political system as a center, but using the Western technological and, and, and military um, advancements. Seems like a reasonably good uh, combination. And then we'll talk about the kind of the decline of the Beiyang fleet. Um, from 1885, that's the year when uh, China created this um, naval office, cent central naval office, where the Beiyang fleet, the Nanyang fleet, and the uh, uh, and the Guangdong uh, Fujian fleets were under. And who was in charge? The person who was in charge was a guy called Prince Chun. And I need to, um, this is the genealogy. Dao Guang gave birth to his three key sons. Xian Feng, Gong, Chun. Okay. Uh, so these are emperors. So Dao Guang was the emperor that until 1850, he, he was during the first, op uh, first Opium War. San Feng is the, is the emperor that had to flee uh, uh, Beijing. And then, and then, um, and then he had a, his son is Tong Zhi. OK. This is very important. And then, and then, and then if you recall from a few, a few times back, uh, San Feng died, uh, gave a few people to be in charge uh, of his son, five-year-old son. Gong and Senfeng's, two of Senfeng's wives, one the main wife and then the concubine, then revolted against uh, Senfeng's choices. And so then, so from 1861 onwards, the power combination would then work something like, at the top, Ci An, Empress Dowager, Ci An, who was the, um, who was the wife, the, uh, the, the wife of uh, Xianfeng, Ci Si, okay, who was the Empress Dowager. So this is the famous Empress Dowager. She gave birth to Tong Zhi, okay. And then with Prince Gong, who was in charge of the modernization process. So that, that, that was from, um, we, we talked about it last time. In uh, 1874, something unfortunately happened, and Tong Zhi died. And when Tong Zhi died, um, actually, legend has it that he he, um, he was born in the uh, in the uh, in the Forbidden City, so he went to brothels in Beijing and and died of syphilis. So that's but but it's impossible to verify. And then, who were to become the next emperor when he died? Because he had no son; he was 19. And Empress Xianfeng had no other son, so. They had to find, and then in general, what you have to do is you have to go down one generation. So Tong Zhi's one down generation. But the problem is, everybody who is below his generation, none of them are actually Dao Guang's descendants. So it's far. They're too far. Like, so it's kind of like um, Elizabeth going down to uh, James the first, right? So China would have none of that. Like, you have to be close. And the person who's close enough, it's either Prince Gong's son, who was... Um, 18, or Prince Chun's son, who was four. Now, Prince Gong's son, if he were to become emperor, then it will go off the equilibrium because Gong himself already has a lot of power. And Prince, uh, and, then, and his son 
was the guy who led him to the brothels. And he also had an affair with, uh, with a Manchurian woman, uh, with a, lady, a lady of ro royal descent, who turned out to be one generation above him. So, so, so he, he'll, he'll be out. And so that's why they had to force Prince Chun's son to be the emperor. So that's Guangxu. He's the main guy. He's uh, uh, 1875 to uh, 1908 as, as emperor. So he was four at the time. And another, another reason why he became emperor was because Prince Chun's wife is Qixi's uh, sister. So Guangxu, the new emperor, is the nephew of Qixi twice over. Right, you think of it this way. But then this is where the, this, this is where the issue is. Guangxu, in some sense, is then not legitimate because in the, uh, in the Qing dynasty, emperors cannot go in the same generation. You must go one down. But again, because one down, nobody's from Guang. So he is now the son of Xianfeng rather than the son of Prince, uh, Prince Chun. Okay, so this, I mean, it sounds kind of, kind of confusing, but uh, it's, I mean, do you have any questions? Uh, I think it's, fine. It, it, it's okay. So, and so it's kind of embarrassing. And then, and then in 1881, Ci'an died. And when 1881, Ci'an died, there's nothing that is uh, creating some kind of equilibrium between Ci'si, Ci'an, and Prince Gong. These are both strong characters. So in 1884, when the uh, war with the French were not going well, Ci'si got rid of Gong. Gong also obviously made a lot of enemies from the traditional side because he's the modernization side. So from here, the power vacuum then goes to the emperor's father, Prince Chun, who is the seventh son of Dao Guang. Now, Prince Chun is very interesting. He is extremely low-key as a person. He, is, he knows exactly what Cixi is, 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 is capable of. So when it was announced that his second son, Guangxu, would be emperor, Guangxu, Immediately, he actually fainted and was not, a, he, he could, they could not wake him up in the Forbidden City and be taken away by others. And he, for many years, for the love of his son, for the love of his own family, has, has always said, you know, like, I am not the Empress' father, you know, that, you know, like, I, I am really here a servant to Cixi, just to protect his own son and to protect his family. But the, the, the ages started uh, coming in very interestingly because I, I, I talked about in, 1880, in 1884 the fleet was gone and so the, the, they, they expanded the Beiyang fleet. In 1885, it was the beginning of the, uh, of the naval office where Prince Chun is in charge. That's also coincidentally the same year when Guangxu became 14, 14, 15. And 15 is a very embarrassing age for, the, for Empress Dowager who is supposedly still in charge. It's because 14 is the age where the first emperor uh, of the Qing dynasty that, uh, that is in Beijing, uh, uh, Shunzi, and also the, the, the second emperor, Kangxi, 14 was the age when they took over power. But in this case, Guangxu couldn't because Cixi is still here. Cixi, for many times in, 18, in 1864, 74, 84, have wanted to rebuild the summer palace. Because uh, Manchurians, they can't, if you go to Forbidden City, there's no grass, no nothing, right? And Manchurians are nomads. So they, 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 they like going around. So like, for example, Dao Guang or Xianfeng, they were only, they were only in um, the Forbidden City like 10 days a year. Most of the time, they were not actually in Forbidden City. They, they only go back to Forbidden City to do certain things. They lived in the Summer Palace. That's why the British burnt the Summer Palace, because, what they, because, because the British thought that the Summer Palace was actually a government office, and the emperor only actually lived in the Summer Palace. So... And, and, and this, is, let's not, this is not about a country-to-country -country thing. It's just about us versus the emperor thing. That's why they built the, uh, built the Forbidden yeah, City. Didn't they burn the Summer Palace also because yes. some British soldiers were being held prisoner? Or yes, 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 yes. So, so that, that, was, that was it. And so when they were held prisoner, and so when they were the revenge, the re so, so what they thought was the revenge should not go to the government of China. It should go to the emperor of China. What they don't realize is that the emperor of China is the government of China, <laughs> right? So... So in this case, Prince, uh, Prince Chun created this naval office. This naval office, there's a nickname, called the Summer Palace Reconstruction Department. The money that went into the, that went to the Navy didn't, never went to the Navy to buy any kind of um, uh, ships or anything. It went straight to rebuilding the Summer Palace for the Empress Dowager. 
uh, it, uh, allegedly for, uh, for her uh, 60th birthday, which would fall in the year 1894. And the reason why Prince Chun, who was really in charge, A, is to, is, is to make sure that Cixi is happy to protect himself, and B, again, the love for his son, if Cixi, at age 60, would move to the Summer Palace, then she would retire in the Summer Palace, and then his son can then take over. So it's really a, it's, it's really a, uh, the very, you could, it's a story of paternal love. But because Prince Chun had to rebuild all of this, it costed about 20 to 30 million taels of silver. Now back to, like, well, what's the context? One Ding Yuan, the, the biggest, the seven ton, uh, the seven ton ship, cost 1.5 million. So we're talking about 20 Ding Yuans. And not all the, and, and each, the fleet has about like 12 to 15, have about 12 to 15 ships. And so we're talking about two more Beiyang, uh, two, two more Beiyang fleets with this amount from 1886 to uh, 18, um, 1894. And also another reason um, for the issue is in 1888 onwards, Wang, who was in charge of the finances of, of, the, em uh, of the empire, who was also the, um, the teacher of Guangxu, uh, said that we are not going to buy any more ships or any more cannons or any more artillery for the Beiyang fleet. And the reason is there's no money. Because he also was very much supportive of the emperor. And in 1889, the emperor had to get married. And get married, and because getting married is more than just getting married. It's also, um, it's also a, a symbol that he's a man, and therefore he can take over power. And in uh, 1889, they spent 5.5 uh, million tails of silver on the wedding itself, which well, I guess, you know, it's about three and a half of the Bing Yuan. And so from 1888 onwards, China or the Beiyang fleet did not buy any more ships. It did not actually, uh, actually not even any more ships, not even a, a, an extra cannon and not even an extra bomb. And 1886, 1888 to 1894 was actually a huge upgrade in uh, modern military. And so this is, the, uh, this is the China side of the story. And actually, just one more thing. When Sisi in 1894, that's when um, the situation in Korea was getting kind of uh, uh, dangerous. They was like, oh, how about... Let, and, and then they, because they scheduled to have all these like, big flower banners and everything along from the Forbidden City to the Summer Palace, uh, it, cost, um, it cost like 2.6 million uh, tails of silver. And then, and then some people were like, oh, you know what? Let's not spend that money because this is only like a moment of pleasure. And then, and then Sissy, this is, uh, she's famous for saying this, whoever makes me uncomfortable for a moment, I will make sure that person is uncomfortable for the rest of his life. So, because, because if, you look, if you go to the Summer Palace today, not, not, not the ruins, the, uh, the, the, the Yi He Yuan, yeah, Yi He Yuan, you could still see the nice lake. Have you been? Have you, have you been to the... No, never been. It's actually worth going. And the lake, actually, uh, Chun Qin Wang had a, a Chun, Prince Chun actually had a very good excuse. They were saying, like, we can't just let all the Hans be in charge of the navy. This lake is, is for the Manchurians to learn to build, uh, to, to learn to be naval officers. So you could see the money that did not channel to Li. Wang did not want to go to Li as well because they're in a different side. So at that point in time, not only was it using the money for pleasure, but it's also, if you think about it, if, if, if the country only, if America, there's only this one general who is in charge of foreign affairs and he had most of the army, the Huai army, and the fleets in his hand, you, would, you can imagine that there'll be a lot of interest to make sure that he is not, um, that, that, that he cannot rise up. And this is, uh, I was talking to a marine biologist and they were saying that, um, you know, Finding Nemo the Clownfish, um, as long as the uh, as long as the um, the father is around, they do they 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 let the uh, little fish to fight to make sure that they're less than eight inches. So as long as and then once the father is gone and then they, they, they and then see whoever grows the fastest and then he will take over. But you know that's politics for you, especially Chinese politics for you. If the father is still here, they make sure that nobody is more than eight inches. The problem with Li or the problem and 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 uh, to to. 
every China, Chinese person's chagrin, Li was both an individual, a Han, which is not the race of the, of, of the ruling class, but he had most of the power in the military. So this is the situation uh, in the, on the Chinese side.